Next, we have the future leader's head. And the topic is leadership and management. He is the head boy of the Dubai Scholars Private School, Dubai UAE. May I call upon Ahmad Rayan Abbasi. Ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good evening to all of you here today. Uh, my name is Rayan. Uh, I am a student at the Dubai Scholars Private School. I was head boy for this academic year and I aspire to continue this political career by running for president next year. Now, uh, before we begin, the most important thing for me to do is collect the remote so I can continue with the presentation. Uh, where's the... Leadership and Management 101 uh, might be a reminder of school. And the main reason why I chose this topic uh, was the fact that fundamentals are really important. And I think so that was highlighted in the first presentation when Dr. Rashid sir mentioned that all these great companies, Toys R Us, you know, they didn't fail because of a lack of leadership, a lack of capital, but rather it was because they didn't have that fundamental belief in them that helped them to move forward. So the main purpose of this presentation is to look at ideals and concepts related to a successful student administration, or in other words, the student council of my school, uh, to apply them to a corporate atmosphere. Now many of you might be wondering exactly how is that possible? How can you apply strategies used by 15, 16, 17 year, old, year olds in a corporate atmosphere? Well, my belief is that we all are humans at the end of the day. And yes, maybe the adaption of each strategy depends on the age you are applying it to, but the needs, the fundamental needs that we all have are the same. So the topics or the ideas that I'm going to discuss with you guys are something that I sincerely hope uh, you will be able to uh, comprehend with me. In fact, I will be giving examples from my school and I will need you guys to do something in Arabic. It's called Qiyas or analogy where you check it out and you try to see how is it applicable to your situation. Finally, why is this important? All of this? Well guys, I'm not sure if you guys know, but in the coming decade, my generation is going to be working with you guys. Um, this is a picture of my school, but before that, I have a small request. May I request all of you to please stand up? Thank you very much. Yes. May I request you all to move one step to your right and one step to your left. And may I request you all to please sit down again. My friend Paran bet with me I'd do a good job if I could move the crowd. Paran, you owe me 10 bucks. <clears throat> so, the Dubai Scholars Private School was established in 1976. It makes it one of the oldest British curriculum schools in Dubai, opened at that time to cater to the expatriate community. Um, it has nearly 1,800 students all the way across from foundation stage one to A levels, which is year 13 or year 12, depending on how you look at it. Uh, I also want to give you guys a small background about myself. So, my name is still Ryan. Uh, I'm 17 years old, and until four or five years ago, I wasn't the ideal student. Um, I'm uh, not proud to say, but I will tell you this, I did give all my teachers very high blood pressure. Um, I took a lot of things very, you know, lightheartedly, and then three, four years ago, when I was in year eight, when I was 13 years old, uh, I had a, an experience that changed my outlook. Um, this one fine day, I'm walking to my school bus. I'm not walking, running, because I was late as usual. And suddenly, uh, my leg starts to drag. And then in the next two, three days, I slowly lost uh, the ability to walk, uh, move around, pick up things. And it was this weird medical episode. But trust me, as ha harrowing experience it was, uh, my parents were quite shook about it. So was everybody I knew. I wasn't at all. In fact, the moment I realized it was very serious, and this is true, is that one of my parents' friends, they came over to the hospital to visit, and while they're going, you know, he looks at me, and he says, Beta, himmat mat harna. And in, that translates to my son, don't lose hope. And forgive me for being insen insensitive, but that was the most Bollywood moment I've ever been in. 
As in, I had only until that moment seen that in movies. And that was when I realized, oh God, this is actually quite a serious thing. And then I counted my blessings. They say you don't count your blessings until you lose them. And at that point when I ha did not have them, I realized what a jerk I had been. At that point I realized, I decided that should I get better, I would strive to be a positive force, a positive change in my school for the community to give back. And that's where my journey began to becoming head boy. I joined into student council in year nine as a consultant. I went on to become a prefect in year 10. And finally, I contested the elections for head boy uh, in year 11. Now, the student council at Dubai Scholars is an executive council that is elected every year. It has a one-year term. Uh, it ranges from 45 to 50 students per year. And men, they range from year 9 to 11. So I just explained that journey of mine. This is a picture of our swearing-in ceremony. Oh, God. <laughs> that was a good day. And this is us on a fun trip. Uh, yep, that's me. And the DS Student Council sets many of its own objectives, uh, some of them including enhancing communication between all our stakeholders. That includes our students, our teachers, our management, the students' parents. Uh, it also includes promoting an environment where learning is conducive, but not only learning because as much as the stereotype has been that, that academics is the most important thing, I sincerely believe that you need to have fun as well while you're at it. And finally, to represent the views of the students on matters of general concern to them. Now, the principles I'm going to share with you, the fun thing is that all of them are things I learned in school. I learned in business studies and economics, things I learned while I was in my physics class or when I was in my chemistry class. And one of them, a business HR strategy that our student council utilized was understanding Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Because now you've got these four or five stakeholders, uh, all of them as uh, Dr. Tarek or dad. Yeah, dad. Where's dad? Okay. Dad? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, thank you, Master. Oh. <laughs> give him a hand. Give you a hand. Yes, please give dad a hand. I hope so. My mom says they, sh they bought me from a store all those years ago. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, the hierarchy of needs helps us understand what exactly we need to target for every single stakeholder, for our students, for our parents, because they have their different needs, but altogether they can be summed up in this pyramid. So right at the bottom, we've got the physiological needs. We've got the air, water, food, and uh, accommodation, and whatnot, safety needs, love and belonging, esteem, and finally self-actualization. So the first one is physiological needs. Uh, in my case, or for our school, it's classrooms, labs, and auditoriums, sports fields, basketball courts, creativity hubs, playgrounds, and common areas. Uh, I tried to think through a more corporate perspective, and I came up with these three. And that comes up to accommodation, a safe workplace, and transport. <clears throat> the second thing is safety needs. Uh, again, in my case, anti-bullying campaigns. Teenagers, they have their rap battles where we go on like, yo, yeah. And we've got uh, arguments that might occur. And the one thing I realized while combating these uh, this past academic year was I could not stop them if I was going to go and say, hey, I'm head boy. I need you guys to stop. Otherwise, you're getting a warning letter. No. What I learned, and it's actually termed as participating leadership. Is, and that is when you go down, when you go on that same level and you talk to them. So they're not talking to a leader. They're not talking to someone a step above them or someone who's older than them, someone who has another position which might be higher. No, they're talking to someone who can relate to them. And that's very, very important because that builds the connectivity, the connection between yourself and the person whom you want to inspire or you want to lead or you want them to do something for you. Uh, the second one is belonging. Uh, this one, again, is from the hierarchy of needs, but I got a better insight when I read this book by Richard Branson called The Virgin Way. In that, he talks about how he puts in virgin employees together, and he brings out parties. You've got Halloween parties and Christmas parties, and they all get together, and they all get to know each other even more, and that builds that sense of family. It builds, uh, in my sense, it builds the sense of the Dubai scholars' family. In yours, it might be different. Uh, 
drinking is not good at parties, just saying. Uh, then team building activities, sports and excursions. And I'll give you an example. Every evening, uh, every evening, usually I head out to the British International School, Ajman. And every evening I go there and I play football with the auxiliary staff there, the cleaners, the drivers, the security guards. And this one day I asked them, you guys have some of the most tiresome jobs. You stand all day, you walk around all day, uh, you, del you um, are doing it in the heat. How is it that you find the motivation or the energy to actually still play football and play quite well, in fact? And they said it's, not, it's because it gives them relief from work. And I realized that no matter how deep you might be into your work, no matter how harrowing, no matter how tired you might be or we might be, we still need that sense of fun. That sense of, you know, relieving all your stress, relieving all responsibility and just maybe half an hour or an hour of just yourself having fun maybe with your friends, maybe having some me time. That's really, really important. Then esteem. This is another thing. When a student council member or any member, in fact, of the student community at Dubai Scholars would do anything, maybe win a championship, win a certificate, so on and so forth, it was always important to recognize them because that built the confidence in them. Someone, could, uh, someone would win something and you go and you say, okay, that's a great job. And that helps so much. And in fact, Dad mentioned earlier, parents praise. When you do something there, isn't it nice when your parents come and they say, oh, that's a nice job, oh, good job, great. Yeah, you know what, let me give you 500 extra for your Eidi. Baba, Eid al-Adha is coming, Baba. And then, but you still need to keep in mind that there are times when they might not do what is right. There might be some errors. So we need to keep an optimistic outlook. We can't go like, hey, no, that was wrong. No, we can't do that. Because I tried that once and that did not work out. No. Instead, I learned personally that it's always better that you talk to them. Okay, fine. Yes, okay, we made a mistake, but we can do it better. There is nothing that is irreparable. And then we move on to self-actualization. This is where the motivation kicks in. This is where we inspire our juniors to do what they could not, you know, what they maybe couldn't comprehend that they can do. My favorite way of doing it with, my, with our students is through MUNs. How many of you all know what MUNs are? All right, fantastic. Uh, MUNs, for your information, are Model United Nations. It's where teenagers and college students, they don the roles of actual UN uh, committees. You take over countries, you become delegates, and you tackle real world problems. Um, some of some committee sessions can be really interesting. One time I was in Security Council and Russia declared war on the entire Security Council. That was a fun experience. So the best way, of course, is to lead by example. And I read this story once, and my suggestion is to not follow that thing. And the thing is, and the story is that one day this boss, you know, he goes to his office, he's bought a new Lamborghini, and he drives, and he goes, hmm. And he stops and he comes out and one of his employees is outside and he says, sir, that's a really beautiful car. And then his boss looks at him with wisdom in his eyes and he says, my dear boy, I want you to work so hard. I want you to work so hard this year that next year I'm able to buy a second Lamborghini. No, that's not the type of leadership we prefer. Even as a child, I would rather that my teacher come down and she explain it to me on my level. The best way, of course, is to lead by example. And then the final point is to share stories of personal failures and successes. I've always seen them work. Uh, the story I told you about myself going from uh, <clears throat> a lighthearted person to a person more serious about what they're doing is one of the stories I share with the student council. And it truly motivates them because you're not talking about, yes, I did this. Rather, we're talking about, yes, I could not do that, but you can. Then another series of indicators are Hirschberg's motivating factors. Uh, we've covered most uh, similar topics in the hierarchy of needs, but there are two I want to touch upon. The first one is responsibility. Delegation of responsibility puts a burden on the junior person, no doubt, but it also teaches them to be able to act. Makes them feel more trusted. 
Again, the sense of belonging comes in. The esteem increases, the motivation increases, the productivity of the student or the person increases, which in turn, of course, is great for your school or for your company or uh, whatever. And it leads to a person being more comfortable with their surroundings, which is, of course, of the utmost importance. It's one thing that I always continuously hear, mental peace is, has no price. Then challenge. To provide a platform or a scenario where people can prove themselves, uh, giving back realistic yet optimistic feedback, thus helping them increase their capital, their human capital. An increase in human capital, of course, in turn leads to a betterment in your function of, uh, in my case, it was the student council. And maybe sometimes they're not able to go up to the challenge. Sometimes we're not able to perform successfully. But that doesn't mean we can't give them a second or a third chance. For instance, for us, we have 1,800 kids. And when His Highness Sheikh Hamdan, the Crown Prince of Dubai, started the Dubai Fitness Challenge Initiative, for that month, 30 days straight, every morning, we brought 1,500 kids into the field. We made them exercise for half an hour, and we sent them back. And that was the utmost challenge for our student council. And, but that doesn't mean that we directly put them there. No, we first gave them the opportunity to maybe organize a class, then a grade, then an assembly, and then finally we progressed up to that final stage. Uh, this is just a small clip of us from the fitness challenge. Dollars! All right, thank you everyone, thank you. I'm not sure if I'm thanking them for doing it properly or for just bearing with us for 30 days. But <clears throat> this experience of every morning coming together really helped our students perform better academically. We noticed that because they weren't going to school early in the morning, sitting down for uh, assemblies and then uh, doing the school prayers and then going directly into work. No, they had some fun in the morning, lifted up their spirits. Yes, we had tests after that, that brought it down completely, but they still lift it up in the morning. Finally, I have two quotes that I want to share with you. The first one is from this old animated movie, A Bug's Life, and it is, first rule of leadership, everything is your fault. And that's true, because if your, if your team, if my team, if our team is unable to perform well, it isn't their fault. That's the, same, that's the reason why Toys R Us today isn't performing that well. The good things is always our fault as well. But the bad things, owning up to that, shows our juniors the, fa uh, the ability to take responsibility, to attain that challenge, and again, make them a better person. And finally, it's a, this is a quote or a hadith from the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And the reason why I selected this one <clears throat> was because I was going through the list of the most influential leaders on the planet not only in this century, but across all the centuries this planet's been there. And in Michael H. Hart's book, the Prophet Muhammad is on the top. So I was going to the Ahadith, and this is the one I thought was really appropriate. And it said, every one of you is the caretaker, and every one of you is responsible for his or her subordinates. And that hit me so hard. Because Yes, our juniors are accountable to us, but in such an important way, we're accountable to them. Our job, a leader's job, the true essence of leadership isn't to stand up on the top step and pull them all up and say, okay, come on, we're going to the next step. No, I sincerely believe, in the opinion of this 17-year-old, is to be on the bottom step, to push them all up, to make sure every single member of our team is up there, so we, before we go up. And that is true satisfaction. That is what I sincerely believe is the true essence of leadership. And I see that every single day. I see that in my parents. I see that in the initiatives Dr. Rashid's taken. And that truly, truly, truly means so much to me. So think, if to a 17-year-old or a teenager who's not even 18 yet, these small principles can mean so much and can cause such a big change in his life. Why could it not in yours? So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all for giving me the time, your time. Thank you so much, and I sincerely hope that this time. Thank you very much.
the right way to become the brand ambassador of Dubai Scholars Private School Dubai by delivering a speech of this kind. <laughs>